What's up, Fox Den Fox here? Today we are taking a look at Intel's sort of like unsung generation because everybody knows about the i7 7700K. It was an absolute legend of its time, and everybody knew about the i9 9900K, Intel's last breath when it came to losing to Ryzen. However, the eighth generation of Intel CPUs is very elusive in terms of conversation and discussion, and I think that's because it was released at a time when Ryzen came out and just absolutely floored the competition. But with that said, I don't think that Intel's eighth generation is bad. In fact, it introduced the first six core CPU that they had, which was really cool. It just took them a kick in the teeth to get there. But today we aren't looking at any of that. We're looking at a laptop CPU, the i5-8250U. Now, the reason why I decided to review this is because my roommate and friend has a Microsoft Surface laptop that he so generously gave to me to review, and I love the 8th gen of Intel CPUs, and I wanted to see what a four-year-old, five-year-old laptop can do in today's world. Do these laptops really depreciate as much as people say that they do, or do they still hold up? I'm very surprised to see an 8-threaded chip in this generation on a laptop for an i5, considering these days i7s are still getting released with the same amount of cores and threads. It has a TDP of a whopping 15 watts, <laughs> with a configurable TDP of up to 25, a max turbo of 3.4 gigahertz with a base frequency of 1.6. It was released in quarter three of 2017 and is 14 nanometer, and it has Intel UHD Graphics 620. Now I will commend Windows for having a 16 by 10 display at a time when 16 by 10 displays were very rare. Granted, the bezels are gigantic, but we're not talking about the laptop per se today. We are talking about the CPU inside of it. So the first thing that I did when I got this laptop in my hands was download Cinebench, obviously, because I'm a masochist. And it scored 2,721 points. So nothing incredibly impressive. I was actually just surprised to see that it's about as third as good as the 7700K. But I think looking back on it now, I realize that this is only a generation newer and also was in a laptop and it's an i5 configuration. So I should expect that, but I was still surprised to see 2700 points. Now, unsurprisingly, Intel has really good single core performance, and that is still the case with the 8250U with a score of 864, putting it above their old i7-4850HQ and a few Xeon CPUs, which aren't fantastic by any means today, but it still is quite impressive to see it still trading punches with like our Threadripper 1950X uh, in the next class above it. So the next thing I decided to do was games, and I'll get into productivity later because I think that's obviously the more important thing, but obviously Intel UHD 620 graphics are not going to be incredibly impressive. With that said, let's just run through a few benchmarks. So first up is CSGO. Now CSGO is my metric, and it was only getting about 40 to 60 FPS with the lowest settings at 1280 by 720. Anything higher than that, we saw a lot more stutter and it became a lot less playable. Now I do not have MSI Afterburner enabled for CSGO because it takes a whole lot of work to get working, but with that said, it was a fairly consistent 40 to 60 FPS. I wouldn't consider it playable because I think CSGO needs 60 to be at least somewhat smooth. But with that said, if you are in a pinch, I think you can play CSGO just fine, which also means that Valorant should run around 60 FPS because that game is also very easy to run. Esports titles like League and things like that are going to have no issues running on a CPU like this at 720p. With that said, I decided to try Overwatch 2 at 1400 by 900, which is the resolution of the display, but I did have it with dynamic res with a minimum FPS set to 30. So this thing was definitely not running at full HD, 1400 by 900. It was likely running at close to half of that. Uh, at the lowest settings, we saw an average frame rate of 44, a 1% low of 4, and a 0.1% low of 2. So the CPU, interestingly, was constantly pegged at 100%, which is not a common occurrence with such weak graphics. Usually you will never see the graphics being held back by the CPU, but for some reason Overwatch 2 really just destroyed this quad core, and that is why the 1% and 0.1% lows are so low. I tested this multiple times with resolution scales and sliders off, and I still got the exact same results. It just seems like Overwatch 2 does not like quad core systems. And although I was very impressed to see a 44 FPS average, and I, if it did not stutter as much, then it would be considered playable. Unfortunately, it was just incredibly hard to play. Now, Stray Next, and I don't even know what I was thinking playing this game because it got an average frame rate of 13 with a 1% low of 0.4 and a 0.1% low of 0.4. 
So you're not going to be able to play in a silly cat game at 720p with the lowest settings, which is what I tried to do uh, at all. You are going to be getting 13 FPS. In some cases, you will be seeing 6. So Stray is off the table, and any AAA titles are going to be completely off the table. I also tried Fallout 4, which is another metric that I use in terms of seeing if graphics cards are modern or not, because Fallout 4 is a very easy game to run these days, um, and anything that can't run it is generally not worth my time. That said, Fallout 4 with the lowest settings, at 1280 by 720 with all anti-aliasing off, we saw an average frame rate of 20 with a 1% low of 9.5 and a 0.1% low of 4. So also an unplayable experience. I'd rather watch a Microsoft PowerPoint presentation than play this game at 20 FPS. And unfortunately, that was just me walking through the town. It wasn't even anything particularly demanding. So... This is definitely not a gaming system, but I don't know why I did this, because as I was finishing up the benchmark, I was like, no, duh, it's not a gaming system. We have really weak graphics, and I wanted to give the CPU the benefit of the doubt. Now, I will say there are times in general everyday use where this thing chugs along like nobody's business, and I think that the Wi-Fi card on this is pretty old because our Wi-Fi here isn't the best, but it's pretty decent, and uh, it was definitely slow to load web pages. But I decided to throw Photoshop at it first, and you can have some of my live candid reaction from that. Oh no, that's not a good sign. Dragging an image. Let's see how long it takes to select a subject. I don't even know if it'll be able to. This is a really blurry picture. Oh my god, it did! Congrats, babe. Now comes the next fun part. How does it... How much time does it take to fill? Oh, that's not a great fill. Once it once it got going, it hasn't been bad. Not awful. And that, that's pretty much the most demanding thing that I have for it is finding subjects, which I'll continue to do because that's what these thumbnails are all about. Alright, blurring is pretty hard on this system, so we'll see. Although, I don't know, it seems to be blurring in real time pretty well. Hmm. Good job, i5. I say that, and then... There you go. That didn't take as long as I expected. That actually took about as long as it would on my Ryzen, my main system, with the 5900X. That's surprising. Oh. That's very impressive. I give this a pass. And as I said, it was completely passable. I had no issues using Photoshop to do what I usually do, and that's pretty much just me making a thumbnail for my Elvis channel. So I might want to go back and test this again sometime because I want to see what timeline scrubbing and playing video back on this machine is like. But with that said, I exported a 1 minute 1920 by 1080p 60fps video and it only took a minute and 46 seconds to render fully, which was very impressive on a 4 core chip. So if you have shorter 1080p videos, you're going to have no issues whatsoever playing around with them. I think once you get into longer 1080p videos or upping the resolution, you're going to run into a lot of issues. Like I said, I want to test that again, but I was just... Pretty impressed considering the fact that I was able to get Premiere to export a video in a minute and 46 seconds. Overall, this is a little machine that could. I was actually quite impressed by how good this CPU was in 2022, considering it's on a laptop. And again, this is a college student's laptop. You know what he does on it? Homework. That's all he does. This thing can run Google Docs like nobody's business. This thing can run Microsoft Word like nobody's business. And that's what it's here for. And I think that that is why I can absolutely say that the i5-8250U is still a wonderful CPU in 2022 for basic usage. But of course, let me know what you think in the comments down below. And if you have an 8250U or any 8th gen CPUs, I'm actually very curious if you still use them uh, or if you want to just document your experiences of what it was like to use them because I would really like to test more 8th gen CPUs in the future. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you liked it, like, subscribe, do what you usually do. And as always, buy yourself something nice.